Hello guys, this is Good Like, and we're back to Let's Go. Boy, what an episode is going to be today, because we are almost wrapping up. So, in the last episode, what did we do? We um, finished up with the playlist? Yeah, we had a playlist ID and stuff like that. Okay, so in this episode, we'll talk about what I did in between, which uh, was quite a bit of work, actually. Uh, this is this is bigger than it looks. Some of these are really small. So, so for example, I had another API to quota check. I mean, that's tiny, but we did have channel info after search as a new API call, and I added it to the check. Another thing that I noticed as I was working on the changes for this episode was that there is in fact a such a thing called YouTube request initializer. Go take a look at it if you want to and it uh, implements some Google JSON initializer stuff. It's a very common thing for YouTube and Google APIs and apparently it's the way to set your key because you can just have a key and a user IP, which we don't need. I think it's used to, like, separate the data that they show to you in your quota usage, because then you... Because key is very much tied to quota usage, and user IP presumably would allow you to identify a unique user, and they apparently show you different user usages. I don't know. I haven't looked that much into it, but uh, we don't need that right now, and hopefully we'll never need that. The main difference is that now you don't have to go through OKHTTP OK if you don't want to. Instead, you can use the YouTube A request initializer, and all that it's done is uh, put the API key into a constructor of the extended class. Get rid of it here, because we can access it through get key. The reason I still have a bit of a this kind of misdirection here and I've kept the HTTP URL, sorry, HTTP, um, okay, HTTP code in here still is because there's no guarantee that we will always use YouTube request initializer. And if I just use YouTube request initializer, I have to use the YouTube API library. And like I said, I don't want to necessarily do that. I'd rather avoid using it for things where I don't have to in an interesting way. Interceptor does the job just fine. It's the same thing. For some reason, this method started not to compile randomly. <laughs> I have no idea, but basically we have two constructors technically which take in a value. And previously this was fine, but now it started, nope, okay, well, okay, I'll fix it. I added the YouTube API utils with one method that is call. This part in particular can seem very familiar because it is. It's uh, the same thing that we've been doing in all of our API classes. We would uh, finagle the YouTube API to get some kind of a YouTube request. We would execute it and then we would constantly catch exception, retry it, catch exception. So I decided to extract it into its own separate method so we don't have to do it all the time. But it's it's kind of really heavily tied to making the request and and pretty much every request is the same thing it's you have some sort of uh quick call which we probably could show well not here in the next request where i replaced it we can see not here maybe but let's say youtube channel search right so wh what do we have originally we take uh youtube we call some sort of api and we expect some sort of API method with certain parts in it. And then we add parameters, and then we execute it. This is the one case where we'd rethrow the IO exception. And uh, as you can see, well, later on, we homogenize that, so that's no longer the case. So instead of that, what we will have is that we call the static method YouTube API's call, which takes in a supplier, which does the first part and a consumer which sets the parameters and performs the execution for us. I opted to create a specific interface for this because it's to make it just clear what it's for and it's really trivial to understand what's going on. The only thing I've done here is remove the public constructors to make them package private and I create another exception which is also package private constructor for the case 
where the API fails outright. And obviously made a test, which just makes sure everything works. Yes. So how does this work? It, it's three parts. Like I said, create a new request, set the parameters, execute it. Very trivial. For the request creation, if we get some sort of an exception, we will explicitly rethrow it with a legal state exception. As you can see here, we catch throwable. Actually, we should be catching uh, just a normal exception or even IO exception, actually. I just uh, originally used a different uh, interface, which threw a throwable, and that's why, that's, that's why it remained here. I'll replace that later. Uh, no biggie. The real point is that this can only happen if some initializer will throw an exception. And by default, no initializers throw any exceptions. So this is very much a programming error rather than something that occurs naturally. It means that some uh, YouTube... Uh, YouTube itself, the object from the YouTube uh, API has been constructed incorrectly. I don't even want to use the initializer at all. So if this happens, I'm almost 100% certain it's a programming error. And that's why we're going to do a legal state exception. Now on the response side, where you execute the request, you obviously can get the parsing exception from JSON. And that's well, not a parsing exception, but rather you can get an error as a response. And otherwise, you can just get all kinds of weird shit, uh, including just about anything you can imagine going wrong. So that's why this falls under YouTube error exception, which hopefully will be handled slightly differently. We'll see, because YouTube warning exception will almost always have some kind of a code or something that it refers to, and it will depend on some JSON parsing, whereas this does not have the same thing. And the parameter setting usually is just straight, straightforward. Another way that this could have been done is by creating a class that does this. You know, you can inject them. YouTube API caller or something. But I decided to put it in a static method that simply is package private because this, this is only going to be intended to be used by uh, the classes inside here to perform a, a bit of a procedure, as you can see. So I don't see any big problem with this as it stands right now. If it was something that I would expect people to use, then I would definitely use a just an injectable class, maybe with an interface even. But since this is something that we just privately constantly use, I think it makes sense. Uh, one way to do this correctly without doing this would also be to just wrap the YouTube class. So you always wrap it and then, you know, you never have YouTube anywhere. You just have this new class that does this. But I, I, I don't see the point. I don't see the point right now to go there. This, this is a simple solution, and if we need to change something up, then so be it. In general, I really doubt this will change. This really defines what I expect to be every single YouTube API call. Uh, I will always create some sort of request, set the parameters, and execute it, and I always want the execution handling to be the same, and always want the request creation handling to be the same. So this is like pretty much set in stone. So there's really no reason to even try to create like an interface and inject this stuff. It's just not worth it. In most cases where you will test the actual YouTube, which we'll be going through here, we use our mock HTTP transport, which requires you to make use of all of YouTube's APIs anyway. So there's, there's not even a a cost to testing it's it's gonna be just the same regardless so that's why i put it into a static method i think it's fine there and then i decided to replace all of this uh, in this case remove the exception same thing here it's now it's just to make it so every single time we call it we do the same handling no more confusion about it. Get rid of some of these methods. Simplifies finding stuff and just going overall. Next up, I refactored search result, playlist, and channel. So previously, as I talked, we had a bit of an interesting case where channel extended playlist. So you can see that's no longer the case, not even close. So what I decided to do is uh, create these two concepts. Normally, you may not want to do something like this early on with any application because you have no idea what those concepts will be 
But I do have an idea what those concepts will be, because we already have looked that far into the future, and since we have some time in the sprint still, because obviously we do, because we expand the time however we want, you know, you want to work all day, fuck it, that counts still as one part of the sprint. Anyway, the idea is simply that I've made an interface which has subscription items in the stream, and it just gets current items, the idea is that you call some place and you get what the items are right now, and and the subscription item is really, for now, doesn't have anything particular, only has search result in uh, it, which search result originally was just a result in the search package, but I moved it inside here. The reason I did this is because YouTube API makes use of uh, a uh, interface or class called search result, so I couldn't just call it search result and keep it outside. So one solution to such, uh, you know, APIs overlapping with each other is specifically to put one of the interfaces into another, especially if they have the same prefix, and then you get this search result. Now we have search result, which is search result in YouTube API, and search.result, which is our search result. That's one way to solve that uh, problem with incompatibilities. And now, as you can see, the channel no longer is a playlist, but rather it's just a subscribable end search result, which is nice and makes sense. The playlist for now is only subscribable and not it's not a search result, though it will be in the future. In the future, we'll be able to probably search anything, including playlists, and then this getID method will be eaten by the search result method uh, extension. Uh, at that point, it will be basically the same thing, you may think, but uh, keep in mind that eventually, maybe, we'll have the possibility for the channel to get playlists, whereas a playlist doesn't have any playlists. So that's going to be one of those differences in why all of these interfaces are separate, because they represent different concepts. Even if right now, as you're working on them, they are literally the same thing, at the end of the day, they represent different things, and as they grow and evolve in your application, they will become different for different reasons. One of those being that a channel can have playlists, playlists can't have playlists. So those are two different things that you can't put in the same interface, and that's why they're separate. The reason why we have these interfaces that extract over everything is because uh, if we didn't, and we just left uh, the original situation, then when playlist would become something that you can search for, the methods in the playlist extension of search result would clash with the methods in the channel extension of search result. Channel would return as, say, channel ID, playlist would return playlist ID, but confusingly, the channel would return some playlists items, and the URL would be wonky. Basically, with this, we separate the two concepts while keeping what they ultimately are the same. This is just a just general, more common concept. And it no longer overlaps, and it has its own uh, definition. So channel ID and playlist ID no longer have to worry about it. They're always going to be separate. So next up, I did some minor fixes and extracted video interface. Another case of weirdness, where it's just the video interface is basically subscription item. So wh what would be the difference between, let's say, a video and subscription item going forward is that potentially you'll be able to subscribe to more than videos. Maybe something that doesn't have the same concept as a video. A video, for example, can always be fully downloaded or something, whereas, let's say, something, uh, f just for the sake of argument, you could technically subscribe to something like Twitter, right? Uh, I personally won't be working on that, I can guarantee you that much, but uh, in theory, the application could handle that case if we work with subscription items, because a tweet could be considered a subscription item in that theoretical application that I'm never going to work on. <laughs> and uh, obviously, a tweet is far different from a video. You can't download a tweet in any meaningful sense of how you can download a video, because it has some sort of file content associated with it, whereas a tweet really just has its uh, text content. You could bend over backwards and say, well, you can download the text content into like a text file or maybe HTML file or something, but I don't think that that's a good idea to like do these bending over backwards. If you're going to do that, you should do that at the top level of the subscription item, whereas that may not necessarily always be the case. And I think uh, 
if you keep doing that, you will find yourself that the APIs you need to implement are very annoying and convoluted. Whereas if you separate those concepts first to where they need to be, it will be easier. And then later on, you can, you know, make something more general if you want to. But at that point, you will have at least some of the work done. So now if I add downloading to a video, I don't have to worry that presumably some theoretical part which would implement Twitter would also have to add download to it. Because it's only going to be on video. I deleted the bad YouTube request bug because it wasn't even making any bad requests. But it was basically almost the same as YouTube API Spike at this point, so I just got rid of it. And I did some more testing on YouTube API Spike by testing out how to get a video. As you can see, I refactored it a little bit so it's clearer what's going on. I made use of the usual interceptors and um, modernized our spike so that we can make use of it in research appropriately. Other than that, we just implemented the video, which I renamed Video Item again for the same problem that we had with the search result search result was taken by google api and video was also taken by google api those motherfuckers are so fucking confident that we should be using their api directly that they took all the best names which is really really fucking annoying if you're gonna make a library that's kind of low level your classes should also be named in low level names so instead of being called a video it should have been something like a video resource or video message or video response or video whatever the fuck but not just video because let's be honest your fucking class that's video which we can go to right now doesn't represent if <laughs> fucking video does it now it's a fucking json class that just has some data in it but it doesn't do anything it's in any reasonable application in which your classes represent some kind of a business object a class called video would be something that actually works with video I would imagine that you'd be able to play it and download it from that class or something like that. Or at the very least, it would give some sort of business information like a link to the video or whatever. But not just a resource that represents it with a bunch of, you know, which is basically is just a data model class, you know? It's horrible. It should have been called video resource. And I know you can just, you know, qualify it. Fuck that. <laughs> like, that is annoying, and lo lo look at how it looks. It's, it's horrible. If, you're, if you want us to do that, then it should be in your interest to make this package name then as small as possible. It should have been literally like YouTube, and that's it. Like, this package, it should have deleted this, deleted this. It should have been YouTube.video. Then, then I would say, okay. You explicitly made this class name annoying to use for other people, but you at least put it in a package that's tiny and that clearly denotes what kind of video this really is, so we don't have to worry about it. Instead, you put it in like six levels deep. It's... <laughs> it's terrible. You people, you didn't, you didn't think this through. And this, again, one of the reasons why I don't like this API just just didn't think oh how will people use this yeah look at their examples their horse shit i decided to do a video finder to be the class name here because uh in this case we're not creating just a video object we're finding the video on youtube by id unfortunately uh the way that that works is that the API, if you give it an ID and the video doesn't exist or is deleted or private, it will simply not return you anything. It will give you an empty items result. We can do a quick test to show you. So let's say a private video, right? You maybe would expect that a private video <laughs> would give you something like... Uh, there's some information that says, hey, it's private, or give you invalid resource. But because this API works as a list, 
it's instead it just returns an empty list. As you can see, now nothing was printed because items was empty. There was nothing to print. There were no items. And empty items is very specifically this. This is what we got. Nothing in the items list. So, unfortunately, that is how this application, well, the API, sorry, works. And therefore, uh, I opted to use optional to represent this. I think this is probably one of the most pertinent uses of optional. I don't know if pertinent was the right word to use there, but the, the idea is that Really, there you will either find the video item or you won't, and you will have never any clue as to why you didn't find it because the API won't give you that information. So when that is literally one-to-one -one mapping in terms of modeling to optional, you either have it or you don't, and you have no idea why. And the YouTube Video Finder is quite trivially doing as everything else is. It's just YouTube videos list. We fetch the ID because it's free and snippet. We set uh, the video ID set results. We technically have the ID, but I don't want to muck around with it if I don't have to. By that, I mean I don't want to edit the video response if I don't have to. So if it costs me nothing, we might as well fetch the ID. It's like whatever. And then we just get the items. And for each of the items, we map the items to a video via lookup, which is the new class, which is very similar, in fact, to another class that we have, which is the YouTube video via playlist. Because those two apparently are separate, which makes sense to some degree. You wouldn't want all that information in just a playlist, because when displaying a playlist, you don't care for it all that much. And uh, YouTube playlist also now has to return YouTube video via playlist. And then all that's left is testing. We added the YouTube mocks, which is basically same stuff as you can see except we're filling different kind of objects and using different end object, but both of these are YouTube video. I renamed the OSA video to OSA video playlist and created OSA video via lookup because it's a different JSON. As you can see, this is what you'll get if you get the video, and this is what you get if you get instead uh, it via playlist. Obviously, there's more fields in this, but we don't use them right now, so they're not going to be present for as long as we don't need them. For mocking, it's quite simple. If the specific ID matches, we get the OS video, otherwise no results, which is the behavior you expect from YouTube. And that's that's what happens. Bad ID, delete, or private, all empty. Sad. It's sad. I was expecting some kind of uh, way to determine it, but unfortunately, I don't think there is. We will be able to determine it ourselves, however, because more than likely, we will store a lot of information we fetch from the YouTube API, and thus we'll be able to determine when something disappears. So at the very least, we'll be able to tell that a video went away. We we'll just won't know why. But we'll know it was there because at some point we fetched it and now it's not there. So that's that's cool. That's that's a thing that we will be able to do with this application. Then I extracted the common logic because, well, let's be honest, all of this and all of this was very, very similar. And then I put them into a parameterized test. Because why not? As you can see, there's actually one normal test among the parameterized tests because there's no real good way to parameterize this. I guess you could do it, but this is fine. We'll see. Maybe I'll parameterize this as well when there's more, if there's more. Then the great maintaining has begun, and we have started by doing a few basic changes. So the first thing that I did is I decided it's about time we have some more control over the max results for queries. Instead of using basically always the default value from args, I decided that you should be able to set it somehow. And that's the new command that will be setting it. And now, as you can see, it's no longer final. And in this case, I mostly just rewrote the text rather than worrying about it too much. I added uh, the functionality that I described. So we added the browser behavior. Essentially, what we, we added was the ability to flip browser behavior and max results. What's this about browser behavior? So if you look at our task, which I will now show, uh, 
We haven't seen this for a while, haven't we? Right. We want, when we select a video and there's a browser, we want it to launch. Otherwise, we want to go to clipboard. But I don't want to disable my default browser, even though I could probably Google it and find a way to do it in a reasonable way. Instead, I just decided to implement it by flipping it, which is more or less the same thing. We know it works. And the odds that it doesn't work are extremely slim. As we're now saving not just playlist but also uh, sorry not just channel search but also the playlist items we now need a different positioning because one is for channel search the other one is for playlist i want to keep these in memory so that you can launch either one anyway and yeah the rest is just implementation details which we will go over when i display what what it does and finally, I added video by ID support, which I had not added at that point. And basically, now you can also just get video by ID. Ray makes perfect sense. Anyway, let's let's just display that. I think rather than looking at that code, it's better to look at the application. Is it not? So this is quite a large definition of how things work. So let's start by messing around a little bit. So as you can see, launching our browser is supported. So by doing this, setting the browser to false, setting the browser to true. Entering random stuff still does jack shit. Uh, max setting to minus one will set it to zero. That sucks. That's, that's a bug. It should not have been that way. Let's fix it live, motherfuckers. End it. End it. Bye to your query. Notice that sometimes you need to press enter twice for some reason, but only sometimes. So I'm, I'm not even going to try to debug that. That's too annoying. So the problem probably is that I set max to 1. That's, that's what should have actually been the case. That you should always be 1 to 50, not 0 to 50. What a, what a trivial mistake. And I will, while I'm here, sex max results for follow-up searches. Yes, there we go. So actually, let's go ahead and commit this under the same day. Yeah, I went and changed that to IO exception as well. I just call this minor fixes. Live, baby! That's how we like it. So now if I set something stupid, such as max equals to minus one, it will set itself to one. If I set it to ABC, it that it will know what the fuck I'm doing because I forgot to put an equals there. It will default to 1 because it can't parse. When it can't parse, it defaults to 0. When it's 0, it will go to 1 because it's too small. Um, 1 is fine, actually. And 1 is fine. We just do the usual, the good like 13, which finds us one channel, and then we can print the first option of our search which is as you can see all of this scuff yeah i still didn't make this lazy because i could i wouldn't be able to know how much how many obviously videos there are but who cares so let's launch something ancient why not do a good old uh yeah, so I want to select video and let's say which which one we want. Well, if we do too big, then obviously it's not going to work. But if we settle for something less ridiculous, let's say what's a good video. Uh, important tip for new and small YouTubers. Yes, that's that's a really cool thing. Pew! It launches in the browser, and here we go. It's it's some tip that I made a long time ago, and even liked my own video. That's amazing. Yeah, like, uh, this was very long time ago, back pretty much when I started the same year. I noticed that if you do certain things with the way that you upload videos, they may or may not appear in search of the website. But, you know, it's been seven years since then, so this tip might no longer actually be relevant. But in mind, I've I've been following it ever since. Uh, to I don't know how much success. 
yeah, it's, it's uh, the way I've been following is that I always upload my videos really long time ago before I release them. That's that's the idea, basically. Don't release videos immediately as you upload them is the best way I would say it. Upload them, release them a bit later. It works better that way. It makes sense, you know. If you just upload it, by it takes time for all the servers on YouTube side to figure out. Oh, there's this video now that we need to show on the search. So it it makes a little bit of sense, you know. It's it's not just crazy. Anyway, let's do another. What else can we do? We can do just a playlist. So let's code playlist, and we then uh, pick. Video. Uh, this series sucks. Let's make it better. Why not? Pew. Launched. Like a boss. Let's say we want to launch some good soundtrack. Because it's good soundtrack. Right? Let's do that. How do we do that? We just say video and paste this and get rid of everything that isn't the ID. And pew. It's launched. And then it runs. Some of the best soundtracks in the world, I guess. Yeah, selected the video and video URL launch and browser. And then let's say we don't want to do any more launching, but we just want to put this into paste. So as you can see, if I paste, we have this video. So let's take a different video like this one and copy its ID. So now if I paste, it's the ID. And then we say video equals to this and video URL copy to this and now as you can see we have the full URL and we can paste it wherever we want. This is also the default behavior if for some reason you don't have a default browser or we can't use it for some reason. Yeah, wow, this should work. Fuck, the fuck happened? I pressed enter and it actually launched the video. Okay, now this is a bug that's actually what the fucking me out. What if I... Okay, there we go. That's the solution. Since I know that the query is trimmed to null, we can just put an empty query. But what the hell was that, man? It just would launch... What the hell? There's a link. There's a magical link here somehow. Look at this. There's a magical invisible link there. It's because I pasted the link and then after I pasted the link, the, the, uh, fucking whatchamacallit still thinks it's there for some reason. Oh my god. Yeah, it's like, it's like a mouse hovering a link in the anywhere in this terminal and there's a link over here it's just hidden and you can't see it <laughs> that's amazing i have no idea what the fuck's going on but i'm sure this is just intellig being intellig so don't 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 worry about it don't worry about it it's it's not important this isn't our application anyway this this entire application only exists for one reason and one reason only so that we can uh, test it. When I'm saying application, I mean all of this main class exists basically just so we can test what's, what did we write? All of these, you know, components, you could say. And, uh, yeah, with this, I think we can say that this is completed. I suppose I didn't, uh, I didn't manage to make it, it being private or whatever, but that's, that's fine. Uh, actually, I'm curious if I, if I, if I do some of these, like, uh, will it work? Yeah, it's either been deleted, privated, or never existed in the first place. So, you know, we, we don't know which one it is, but we can still post that it's one of them's trees, you know. That's backwards. That's a known query. And now I'm going to switch to browser behavior because I don't want to launch it. There we go. Some life theory because why not? That's an unlisted video where I just added some life theory on one part of one video and I put it in the Dark Souls 2 playlist. It's a silly video. Don't, don't look at it. 
Anyway. I think it's fair to say that we've completed this. And with that, you would say, well, the sprint is complete. No, there's one more. There's accepted status, which needs to be actually be what happens. Um, it, it's fair to say that I think I would agree that the sprint is, in a sense, complete because we've done everything. But uh, there's, it's not like we can't do more. As you can see, this application class has become a little bit of a a little bit of a mess, right? I mean, this this is like, okay, fine. It's part of the application. Input produces out some kind of output. That's fine. Even something like this, maybe, maybe not. But the point is that there is actually quite a bit of logic inside this class, like launching the browser or copying the clipboard, which you could say that this should not be sitting in the main, and I think I would agree. So my goal with any future changes that we're going to be doing is to kind of extract the remainder of the skeleton from main and write some acceptance tests. Acceptance tests meaning for all of these cases, I want to write a test that will essentially do some stuff to the application skeleton, and the skeleton will then try to give us a response which will still be mocked out to some degree and then we'll see if we get the right response but it will test the entire application rather than just as our unit tests which test just let's say the specific method call so that that's what i call acceptance this i don't know if that's hip these days Anyway, that's my goal for today. I'll probably be working a bit later today. So thank you guys for watching and I'll see you later.